When I finished residency training back in, if you can believe it, 1997, that is just when the lasers were getting FDA approved. And so the first laser got approved when I was still a chief resident in ophthalmology at GBMC in Baltimore. Um, and so when I came out, it was kind of, it was new, it was, it was exciting. It was a way to change a person's life in a matter of minutes. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I know I met you two ways. I met you because we are both ophthalmologists and, um, you, you know, Dr. Goyles had held many leadership positions in ophthalmology as well as um, locally. So we met also because we were both on the, the Maryland uh, Board of uh, Physicians for Ophthalmology. Uh, mm -hmm. But then also uh, Dr. Goyle did LASIK on my husband and my <laughs> mother-in-law. Um, so when I mentioned that I knew you, uh, they, they were like, yeah, we know him. We, we, we've known him for years. Um, so, okay. So I want to dive right in. So first I want to talk about LASIK and PRK because those are just so widely known. Everyone talks about them. Um, it's one of the most common questions I get from my patients. Um, so what is the difference between PRK and LASIK? And what are the sort of considerations that you look at when you look at a patient for these surgeries? Another great question. So when, when the lasers were first approved back in the mid to late 90s, they were approved to do PRK to start with. And PRK is short for photorefractive keratectomy. And that's where we make an abrasion on the cornea. So we scratch the cornea, do the laser to correct your vision, and then have you wear a soft contact lens on the eye to help the abrasion to heal. Great results with PRK, but patients didn't like the pain with that you, you would get with the procedure and the slow vision recovery and the slow healing process. And so then we can out with something called LASIK. And with LASIK, we're, we're not only using a laser like we do with PRK, but instead of making an abrasion like you do with PRK, we make a flap on the cornea. And the cornea and the corneal flap is about a 10 clock hour incision. So if you're looking at a clock face, it goes from one o'clock down to six and back up to 11. So 10 clock hours. And then you lift that flap up, do the laser in the middle of the cornea like you would do for PRK, and then put the flap back into position. And the advantage of LASIK over PRK is that you have faster vision recovery, less discomfort, uh, and you're back to your activities much more quickly because you heal much faster. And so back when we only had eczema laser procedures, which is what PRK and LASIK are, most patients would choose LASIK unless they had thin corneas where PRK was preferential or if they had a corneal scar where maybe we, we couldn't make a good flap through the, the, through the scar, essentially. Um, in the beginning, we also had uh, blades to make the flap. So it'd be a blade that would go across the cornea. It sounds terrible, but that would make the flap and we'd lift it up and then do the laser but now we have all laser LASIKs. So we have a laser that can make the flap for us. It's much more precise, much more elegant. Um, lift that flap up again, do the laser, put the flap back down. So are there still situations when you're choosing PRK over LASIK? And what are those situations? Yeah, it's, there certainly are. And so um, I choose PRK in my practice about 5% of the time, LASIK about 15% of the time, and SMILE laser eye surgery, which, which we'll talk about in a moment about 80% of the time when patients qualify. But the times that I recommend doing PRK is in patients who have thin cornea. So the corneal thickness isn't sufficient to make a flap and treat their correction. And so the higher your prescription is, the more laser we need to remove to correct your vision. But there's a maximum level of tissue you can remove from a cornea. You need to maintain a minimum 250 micron thickness in the cornea to maintain stability over your lifetime. So if you do LASIK and then do that treatment and you can be under that 250 threshold, it's generally not a good idea. So I recommend PRK for those patients. And the other time I recommend PRK is if a patient has a previous corneal scar, which could happen from like wearing contact lenses or getting an injury to the eye or, or, you know, or mechanics who get metal in their eye and have like little metallic form bodies and, and then rust rings within the cornea. Those patients do better with PRK because I can actually remove some of the scarring with the PRK. And then the other category of patients are those who have like a corneal dystrophy, something called anterior basement membrane dystrophy, where their surface of the cornea is very soft and it has a tendency to, to abrade by itself um, because it's kind of an irregular surface. So by doing PRK for those patients, we can not only treat their correction, but also treat the corneal dystrophy at the same time. And I would say, and tell me if you agree with me or not, but like, I guess my view on this is that the biggest problem with PRK is the pain. Like people just, it's it's too painful. Absolutely. It's the post-operative pain in the management uh, and then the slower vision healing. So the, the abrasion has to heal first over five days and then the inflammation has got to resolve for the, for the vision to recover. 
We can now manage pain better today than we have in the past. So with a combination of uh, ibuprofen and acetaminophen pills, uh, that gives you narcotic type pain control. I will sometimes throw tramadol on top of that to control the pain. So we're able to control the pain better. Um, but really, it's the patient having to be out of commission for you can't work for five days while the abrasion is healing. And that, it usually if like a, a low myop, like a minus three or minus four, they're back to work in seven days. But if you're like a minus 10 or minus 12, it could be two weeks until you can drive. And so that, that could be a, a problem with most patients getting that kind of time off from work. And yeah, that's work. not that's not insignificant at all because no, it's not. That's like yeah, the same as a C-section. <laughs> <laughs> I was out of commission for like two to three weeks. So <laughs> let's move on to LASIK. And you had mentioned smile. So tell me the difference. Well, first of all, I, we had talked before and you were like, I tell people I do smile eye surgery and they think it's a dental procedure. <laughs> and that's true because I smile is an interesting name. Uh, but so tell me what is smile eye surgery and how is it different from the first two procedures that you mentioned? Sure. No, and you're right. Smile is a terrible uh, uh, name for the procedure, but it, smile is short for small incision lenticular extraction. That's how I came up with that acronym. Uh, but what SMILE basically does, and instead of making a large 10 clock hour incision on the cornea, like you do with LASIK, SMILE makes a very small two clock hour incision from 11 o'clock to one o'clock up high on the cornea, so it's under the upper eyelid, so it's protected. And through that small incision, I remove a very thin, small contact lens shape, shaped piece of tissue from within the cornea. And so, and that's carved within the cornea using a laser. So the way I like to describe it to patients is imagine having a book. And so with LASIK, I would take the hard cover of the book, lift that cover of the book up, and then laser off pages one through 10 to correct the vision and then put that, that cover of the book or the flap back into position. But with SMILE, what I do is the laser can go through the cover of the book in the, into the pages within it and create a layer of bubbles between pages 50 and 51, and then again between, between pages 40 and 41. And then I remove those, those pages from 41 to 50 through a very small incision on the cover of the, of the book versus having to lift up the entire cover. And so by doing it that way, as you can imagine, the cornea stays more intact. It's a closed system. So you're not, uh, you're not as sensitive to temperature changes within the room or humidity changes within the room. Um, and so what we're finding is that the retreatment rate is about a third with smile as it is with LASIK. And in our patients, we're seeing less dry eye symptoms with our smile group than we are with a LASIK group. Um, and so for those reasons, if a patient qualifies for both LASIK and SMILE, I'll generally recommend SMILE to that patient. The times that a patient doesn't qualify for SMILE, that's going to be your next question, right? Yes. Is that smile, SMILE is only approved for myopic patients. You have to be nearsighted between minus 1 and minus 10. So you can't be farsighted or have mixed astigmatism or be under minus 1. And no more than three adopters of astigmatism. And so if you're outside the range of SMILE, I can't even offer it to you. 